Okay, I show 6.30. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Board of Directors on January 18, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Holly, would you call the roll? President Hill. Present. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fulz. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Staff? No changes. No changes to the agenda. Okay, next is oral communications. This portion of the agenda is reserved for oral communications by the public on any subject that lies within the jurisdiction of the district and is not on the agenda. Any person may address the Board of Directors at this time. Normally, presentations may not exceed three, inch, three minutes in length, and individuals may only speak once. Please state your name and town or city of residence for the record at the beginning of the statement. Please understand that the Brown Act limits what the Board can do regarding issues not on the agenda. No action or discussion may occur on the issues outside of those already listed on today's agenda. The Director may request that a matter raised during oral communication be placed on a future agenda. Do we have anyone from the public that wishes to address items not on the agenda tonight? Seeing none, we'll move on to unfinished business. Low income rate assistance program. So that's gonna be- board. Yes, thank you. That's going to be a sure. yeah. thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Heather I. Paletti, Interim Finance Director. Um, the, the action before you is to approve increasing the amount of the low income discount provided by the rate assistance program to $20 per month up to $240 annually, effective March 1st, 2024 assuming the adoption of the rate increase in February of 24. You have your staff report in front of you. And would you like a further presentation? So I have a question. Um, how much do we anticipate we'll spend with this and versus budget? The adoption for the for the program is 20 in the current fiscal year and 25 next fiscal year. The year-to-date expense through December 31 is 7,260. Right. And it is anticipated that the current fiscal year, even if we increase it to the $20 starting in March, we will have plenty of budget. And for the entire fiscal year, Next year, we'll have it. We'll have sufficient budget to cover it. That's why I only increased it by, by the amount up to twenty. And I'm not proposing a budget amendment because the existing budget does cover the proposed change. If we went to twenty-five instead of twenty, would we uh, break the current budget? Hold on. We'll do a quick count. Yeah. Yeah, the current the current fiscal year budget would cover up to 127 customers. So in reality, it all depends on whether your your customers okay. increase. So yes. right now I've got it balanced within the current budget. If you increase the amount, it may cover it, but you're you're at a risk of of if additional customers start participating in the program. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, let's go around and ask the rest Director. of the directors if they have any questions. Um, Thank Mark? you. Um, <clears throat> have we given any consideration to staff or uh, the committee that reviewed this um, changing how people qualify for this? Because I've heard uh, the difficulties 
of first going through PG&E, getting on PG&E's program in order to be able to qualify here. So has that um, been sure, that, that is a really good question. I, I have not. not that and this is why how would i how do i put this nicely i i don't think it's put staff in that kind of position to determine whether customer qualifies for the program mm -hmm. i think it's it's nice that we if a if a customer qualifies under the pg e program yep. then they're in if we change that qualification then we're reviewing documents. We are we are mm -hmm. determining no. a yes or no. That's a tough position to put staff in. Understand. Okay. It, or in, in addition to PII management, in a way that we may not want to PII personally identifiable information. Oh, okay. Yeah, but All tax right. returns, okay. so, things like that. That's. Thanks. So, so I don't have any questions. I opposed this in the past for the primary reason that this is a solution that needs to be done at a state level at scale. The state continues to not fulfill its obligations under the, I forget the name of the law that was passed declaring water as a human right and has never funded that program. Mm -hmm. um, we as organization need to join with other organizations, perhaps through our association and say, please fund that program so that this can be offered at a much, much broader scale. Um, until then, I think by trying to do it on our own, we're basically giving the legislature a pass on their obligations and responsibilities. Thank you. Jamie? Um, I, I think this is a step in the right direction, but not far enough, um, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. I don't think that this makes a really meaningful difference, you know, given the cost of living in our area. But um, I don't want to discourage us from, you know, offering people more relief rather than less. So I don't have any other comments or questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I support this. And, and you know, $240 a year is, is, it's better than a stick in the eye, let's put it that way. So I think, I think you know, we're, we're helping people to some degree. And I think that is not non-deminimous, you know, it, it, it means something. And I also think that uh, Heather is correct and that we should just increment raise this a small amount initially because we don't know how elastic the demand will be you know if we jump to 25 then maybe a bunch more people will want it and then we're in a position of either having to limit them or say no you can't have it because you didn't apply in time and so there's nothing to prevent us from you know if we go up to 20 and find that it only brings in a few more people mm -hmm. and everything goes according to plan with the rate increase that we increase it again um, and I, I think it, that's a better way to, to do it, um, to just protect us and make sure that we can have as many people can participate as possible. And to your question, Mark, the budget and finance did ask sort of the same mm -hmm. question of, you know, is there some other way to do this? Also, partly because uh, there, there's also the issue of that um, this only works for people who actually own the property. It does not work for renters. And that's actually, in, in most of our view, a bigger problem than the fact that they have to apply through PG&E. And we, you know, I'm not sure how to solve that, but I think that's maybe something that budget and finance should think to investigate more if there's some way to do that without getting us into the sorts of problems that Bob has suggested with personal information yeah. or huge amounts of staff time. Yeah. Comments from the public? Staff, comments? Can we have a motion? I'll make the motion that the board approves increasing the amount of the low income discount provided by the rate assistance program to $20 per month up to $240 annually, effective March 4th, March 1st, 2024, assuming the adoption of the rate increase in February. 2024. Second. Second. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. President Hill? Yes. 
Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? No. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Thank you. Okay. The next item on unfinished business is the discrimination, harassment, and retaliation policy. We'll have discussion on possible action regarding changes to the policy. Um, <coughs> again, we'll have the, the board members comment. We'll ask the public, we'll ask staff, and then we'll go to a vote. If there's Can I this staff is presentation first? Sorry? A staff presentation about yes. this? Is there a presentation for this? Thank you. Okay. Um, so we brought this item to you in December, December 7th. Mm -hmm. At that time, uh, it was asked that we do some general cleanup on the document, but also make sure that we're including the board members and committee members in the policy so that we're enveloping them into the same policy. So then taking it to legal, we also made some edits um, that bring the document up to date with the latest regulations on harassment, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we put a draft in the in the agenda and also a red line copy so you can see what the edits and changes are. Um, what's important is you're, you're adopting this by resolution and the resolution actually approves this for the next year and subsequent years, though you also have in your policy that you review it every year. Mm -hmm. which one doesn't conflict with the other. It's just it's both the truth. So that's pretty much it. And um, I'll let, let it open up your comments at this point. Or sorry, questions. And this is this is Barbara Brenner. And I, I'd just like to make one comment before the board starts the discussion or actually one uh, request that you make a slight edit to this, what we proposed. And that slight edit is to remove the terms with malice on page 18 on the first sentence below abusive conduct, workplace bullying. And it's mostly, uh, I'm asking you to do that just because it, it doesn't grammatically work. And it, I think it doesn't help us that much. Um, in other words, I think the, the examples below in that paragraph or, or a better way of determining what the abusive conduct bullying is versus adding the term with malice in the middle of that first sentence on page 18. So I, that's my slight change that I would recommend. Okay. So we'll have comments by the board that will go to the public and we'll see if there are any last minute changes on that vote. Mark? Um, staying on that page 18, um, same sentence that Barbara was referencing uh, in the with malice. Uh, I see committee members referenced in other places, but I don't see that committee members referenced here in this paragraph on the abusive conduct workplace bullying. Was that intentional or was that? Um, I think uh, in the red line version, it, does it read abusive okay. conduct or workplace bullying is the conduct of any employer, employee or member of the board of directors in the workplace? Mm -hmm. Right, my comment is, should that apply to committee members also? Oh, yes. The committees, because we've yeah. okay. we've pulled out yeah. committee members. Sorry, I didn't I didn't uh, understand what you're getting at. In okay. other portions of the document, to keep it parallel. So, Barbara, would you care to comment on that? One? Yeah, I'm just looking because the scope applies to all persons involved, including officers and board of committee members of the district. In the first, on page sixteen. And then it, and then it, do, it does indicate board committees under harassment prevention. I understand. I saw. I see it there. I didn't see it with this paragraph, where again 
employer, employees, members of the board are called specified. So can, can I yeah. just suggest a change there along that line of just after member of the board of direct of board of directors um, or um, board committees board committees yes okay yeah and and I, qu I question whether it should be there or not because there were there was another area that I think was focused on training where committee members were not called out where I think it was appropriate that they are not involved in that training yeah so okay yes I think that that should be included in this section okay okay, um, okay. Uh, that's my only question. Yeah, a couple of questions. From a clarity point of view, uh, when I look at the original policy on page three, it says this policy applies to all persons involved in the operation of San Lorenzo Valley Water District, including any and all employees, supervisors, managers, coworkers, officers, and board or committee members of the district. Um, are we confusing things by adding to that in various sections? as opposed to, for example, in training section saying, this part of the policy shall not, shall not apply to committee members. I think that's really the genesis of the confusion is that, is that the scope already covers in the original policy already covered everybody. And throughout the policy, we kind of say, well, it's board, you know, we, we add all the redundant, it seems redundant in that sense. And I think it's also confusing. Um, I suppose if they're all the same, as this first sentence in the policy, that might make it clear. Um, but I, I just think from a drafting point of view, that, that certainly confused me as well. Uh, the other question I had was, uh, when, I, when I look, and, and by the way, this sort of goes back to a memo from Gina Nichols from December of 2020, where she was recommending um, uh, harmonization and or elimination of the respectful workplace policy with this policy. And I think I remember at the time in the discussion, her recommendation was to keep this policy um, sort of in line with um, government code uh, 12940. And if there's anything else that we wanted to do, either do that in a separate policy um, uh, or you know, merge everything together and keep those separate so that people looking at it know which part deals with government code 19240 and which one doesn't. So a question I have is, is all the changes that are made in here taken directly from uh, government code 12940 etsec, I guess is the fancy word. Um, uh, and if so, I was hoping maybe offline, um, you could point me to where those were because I, I went through and I wasn't sure that everything was lining up. And, and I, I really wanted to follow Gina's recommendation of keeping this close to that part of the government code. That'd be a question for council, I believe. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I'm not sure to tell you the truth off of, off of the top of my head because I had labor employment folks in my firm revise this and talk to me about some of the new provisions as far as new laws, um, but we didn't talk code sections. So I, I can't repeat to you which code sections they relied on in this instance. I know that we were asked to take a look at this policy and do this one first, not with any reference to another policy or a particular government code section. So, my understanding is that we were not, we did not limit ourselves to that one code section in this policy. Yeah, I mean, I think when you get to page four is where it introduces the concept of Title Seven of Civil Rights Act of 64 and the government code 12940 at SEC. And since this is, I mean, if you look at the, that code section, it, it seems to follow pretty closely with this which is why I think that's referenced. If there are other things that are being referenced and the and other codes that were being used in here, I think those need to be referenced as well. Um, perhaps the labor attorneys could help us out with that too. Yeah, what, I see which page four of 10 that you're looking at. 
agenda package, page 16. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm I'm I'm, I'm looking at the policy, the current policy itself. Um, You're yeah. referencing though agenda package page 16, correct? The footnote yeah. one. Hang on. Or no. No, you're not referencing that footnote. It would be it would be seven. So the original statement I made about the policy application is on page 16 in the board packet. The reference to codes, the reference to codes, I believe, that are underlying this policy are is on page 17 in the board packet. Okay. Let me just I, I don't you know, I don't want to say absolutely right. I want to make sure that I'm correct in that. So I still don't. Well, you know, the one two nine four zero is quite, I mean, it's it's a lot. Right. <laughs> So I don't oh, know. I see where you're looking. Okay. I, I, I don't know if if it's something that you do in real time here, but it, it did strike me that if we're if we're moving beyond the one two nine four zero, which is what this policy was originally intended to mirror, then we yeah, probably uh, I don't. We probably now need that to I know what you're referencing. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Now that I see exactly what you're referencing, I would say no. That's what we're trying to capture in this. So, but I will double check and confirm that. Thank you. Okay. Jamie, comments? Um, <clears throat> On uh, page 21 of the packet under the section training requirements, um, I note that we, uh, it does, it looks like we don't require committee members to do the same uh, harassment and discrimination trainings that we require board members and employees to do. Is that accurate? Yes, and I and I think yeah. that's appropriate, right? Okay. Um, given that that it's a lot to ask committee members to have to undergo this, and their you know, and their contact with staff is is not all that great. So, um, the the only thing I noticed when I read that same section was that we didn't specify how many hours mm -hmm. the board of directors folks needed to do the training, and I I would just recommend that we. We specify in the part where it says managerial and supervisory and board of directors because they're in effect in a, right. a supervisory role, so that they should do the two hours too. Is that is that okay, Barbara? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just note it says either online. Oh no, okay, as required by law. So generally, we're we're watching whatever the, whatever the board members are required to do. Sometimes those change, so um, I would be fine, you know, because it still contains as required by law. So that that may change. The board member hours may change. Requirements may change. So just note that. Um. Okay. Um, as I see it, um, before I go out to the, I I haven't had a chance to speak. Oh, I, I thought you you were just speaking. Out. <laughs> no, I was commenting on Jamie's. Um, I, I want to address Bob's comments first. That he says it's somehow confusing if we call out the members of uh, the board of directors and the members of board committees at each mention. And the reason I, I disagree with that is I think it was confusing that they weren't called out because in most, it says it only once at the very beginning of the document that, they, that this applies to them. And then everywhere else in the document, it said referred to employees only. And so anybody just doing a quick read through and looking at the part that they think might apply to them would not think that this policy applies to members of the board. And so my suggestion of including that was to make it explicit at every occurrence that these policies also applied to the board. And I think in contrast to what Bob says, it actually 
makes for greater clarity about what we're intending um, to do here. Um, the second thing I would say is I don't think we want to, um, this is our policy, right? And we decide what we want um, the, the types of conduct that we consider acceptable or not acceptable. And um, whether, uh, you know, you can do this kind of lawyerly arguments about whether it follows exactly the lines of certain kinds of laws um, does not carry much weight with me because uh, as long as you're not putting something in the policy that is blatantly against the law, it, it's our policy. And we set our, you know, can set our own standards. But I think it's it's certainly true that this language, if, if you read it, is clearly pulled from existing <laughs> material. This didn't just come out of the, the air. This is a kind of language about abusive conduct and workplace uh, bullying. So I, uh, I, you know, if you, if you want to bring in one more code that we base some of this on, that that's fine. But I don't think I want to put this off to do a bunch of detailed work of uh, trying to figure out whether this code or that code applies to things. And I want to um, thank uh, Brian and Barbara for inserting the language that describes specific behaviors that would be considered sexual harassment. I think, you know, everybody understands that quid pro quo is wrong, but the what constitutes um, hostile work environment is a little bit not quite as clear. And by being specific, we're signaling what behaviors aren't acceptable in the workplace. We make it clear to people on the receiving end of those kinds of behaviors, what behaviors are grounds for a complaint. And we provide more guidance to supervisors and to the board as to what constitutes violations of the policy. And um, I'm also very glad to see the addition of the new section on abusive conduct and workplace bullying. Again, giving specific examples of unacceptable behaviors is, is very helpful. It strikes me as especially important um, for interactions where there's an imbalance of power, such as between a supervisor and a subordinate or um, a board member and staff. So thank you for putting those um, examples in. I think it makes the policy much more clear what what we don't consider acceptable and um, just for, for everybody. Thank you. Okay, comments from the public on this subject? Yes, please. Yes. Um, Rick Graham from Venlo. Uh, thank you. Uh, first off, I want to say that it is of the utmost importance to have a safe workplace, workplace and I support this policy. Um, when I saw this on the agenda, I was concerned that this was an, another way that we were going to talk about the charges that were brought up against uh, Director Fultz. So that's what I prepared my statement for. So uh, please allow me that understanding, okay? Um, because there, there's a narrative out there that's going on that, um, that one person is responsible for a lot of stuff that I don't think is actually true, okay? Uh, so here's my statement. Uh, to put all the blame for staff morale and worker retention on one person, I believe it overstates or tries to simplify the problem. While recently losing the general manager and finance director is problematic, the district has dealt with senior staff departure in the past. Within the last few years, we have had the district council lead, the previous finance director, the district engineer, and a water treatment specialist, all left. These losses are not the fault of one person, but rather somebody's choice about their career. Issues of retention are not unique to this water district. I have attended many board meetings and have witnessed way too many personal attacks rather than debates about policy. Also, I have listened to way too much micromanaging and repetitive arguments with repetitive attempts at persuasion. These behaviors are not serving the people of our valley and mountains very well. It also discourages people from being involved in our water district. Director Fultz has been elected three times by the people of this valley, once to the school board, and two times to the board, to this board. 
yet he has never been chair of the board. He served six years so far. To me, that sends a powerful message. We do not trust you. It is a well-established norm that boards rotate members to the chairperson. That is where a member can learn the complexities and responsibilities of that job. Most parents, most teachers know that if you want to, uh, people to act responsibly, you must give them responsibility. Just as this board should commit to some sort of self-reflection, Director Fultz should as well. If you hear similar complaints from multiple sources, you should listen and consider what you can do about the complaints. To that end, I will suggest again that some formal training on contentious issues be had. While some may disregard this training, predetermining a negative outcome is just a self-fulfilling prophecy. Instead, seek some training, and with an open mind to improve our water district, chances are some good may come of it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, on page 23, this is kind of the bottom line of the whole policy, I guess. Uh, it says um, employees or board member. Uh, we, I'm sorry, I'm throwing my glasses on, but it says um, they may be held personally liable for the misconduct. Um, so about 10 years ago, I found out that a board member had sold a house to this district and accepted a real estate commission. And that is a conflict of interest and that's against the law. Um, but but he truly believed, he, he had been on the board for 20 years, and he truly believed that he was golden. If he was a board member, that he was golden. He could do no wrong. And he had gotten that idea from the district council at the time. And as soon as uh, a lawsuit came to the board, they immediately decided to defend, defend the board member. They, they circled the wagons, and they said, let's defend this guy. Um, so this is a complete reversal from that. This is saying, wow, we're gonna, we're gonna identify a board member and we're gonna hold him personally liable. And I guess I don't understand who's gonna do this. I don't know, is the disgruntled employee gonna sue a board member or is the four out of five board members gonna get together and say, yeah, let's have a lawsuit and let's sue the board member. So I don't really understand what this means about personal, personally liable. Um, now, looking around the table there, I see, uh, looks like a coffee cup or a water glass, and I see a lot of laptops. I can imagine being up there at the table, and I might just knock over a cup of coffee on your laptop by mistake, and all of a sudden, it cost $1,000 worth of damage just for coming to a meeting. Um, and I'm kind of wondering where this is going to lead. Are board members going to be suing each other uh, for, for small slights? Uh, is the district going to be suing a board member? And then the other thing is, um, there's this confirmation. Uh, this is on page 28. It says board member's signature. So suppose somebody who isn't here tonight decides to run for the water board in November and they get elected. So all of a sudden, they get elected, they start getting broken in. And at some point in the process, a few months down the road, I guess it says you have three months to do this. Um, then they're they're going to be presented with this confirmation of receipt, and and they're acknowledging this whole policy, which says I'm going to be personally liable. So I'm kind of wondering if somebody gets elected in November, and then next February they decide I don't want to sign that because I don't want to be personally liable. If you think I'm personally liable, you 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 prove it in court, but I'm not going to sign that. I don't understand what what consequence you can impose. Do you think you can censure the person at that point for not signing the statement? Thank you for your comments. Do we have any further comments from staff on this? Uh, not for me. Okay. It sounds to me, and let me just make my own comment here, that we are close, but there are some uh, 
small edits that could have major importance, but they're not, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of text. And so I'm going to ask if we have a well, I think Mr. Holloway asked a really good question. Are we just going to not answer that? How, how would the enforcement policy work on this relative to personal liability? Is the board going to sue individuals? That's Barbara's how, how that? answer. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think the word I, may as opposed to will be. I, I, I get that, but may means absolutely possible. And I think it's a reasonable question that he asked. And I think when community members ask reasonable questions, during our discussion and debate, we should respond. We have raised this issue and we are discussing there, it. This is, this is Barbara. There are times when a district gets into a uh, civil litigation against individual board members or employees. Those instances do occur. Does this, does this policy encourage that? I don't think so. This policy is trying to set up what is, you know, was defined in the law as harassment by folks that are in public positions and, and employees of a, of a uh, district. So this is not unusual, this type of policy, nor is it unusual that this type of policy apply to board members and committee members. So is there a possibility of Litigation always, always. When there's harassment involved, there's that possibility. But this policy is not intended to encourage that. This policy is intended to inform and make people aware of what is considered to be harassment and bullying. And have some sort of notion that what will occur if if that is happening. I think the answer to Mr. Holloway's question is yes, could absolutely happen. Uh, so my only comment on that is the alternative, the opposite of that is that the board is indemnifying all the board members and uh, everyone else. Uh, that, that's not going to happen. In the, well, I understand. Uh, but I mean, in a harassment uh, claim, Jeff, come on, you know that. Well, but if if you remove the fact that there's personal liability, then, then you have the uh, indemnification. I want to come on this also. Um, to, to respond, first, I would just say that you may be held responsible. What that's really saying is that, you know, if there is behavior that's so egregious and that through informal processes we can't get you to stop you should be aware that we do not indemnify you forever and in fact mm -hmm. after the Vieira case um, the board policy manual was extensively modified to make it clear that the board would not indemnify somebody you know to the full extent that depending on what had actually happened um, it would be you know, appropriate. And so what this is saying is that depending on the circumstances, yes, an individual could be uh, sued and it would not be the district's uh, responsibility to indemnify them depending on what the nature of it was. And I, and I think that's an important, it's a, it's a reasonable thing to alert people to that, 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 their, that their behavior has consequences. Okay. The, and, I, and I think the other key point of that last sentence that Mr. Holloway is flagging is, is the word unlawful. Yeah. I, I'm not going to determine what's unlawful. We have um, civil statutes that specify that. Um, so if somebody is crossing that line of unlawful, yes, they need to be held accountable. And this... Um, last sentence certainly wasn't inserted uh, this round of, of review. Right. It's been part of the policy for some period of time. So I, I find this acceptable. So, can I, Barbara? Yeah, I just wanted to add one more statement that this policy wasn't geared toward any particular person as 
you know, indicated in one of the comments. The, these edits came from legal. We we don't we're not attempting to focus on any particular individual by any means, and certainly not a particular director. We're we're trying to produce to you a policy that is in compliance with current law and make sure that folks that are operating in your system, including board members and committee members, are aware of those laws and, and the consequences. So I, I just want to make that clear. Okay. Okay, seeing no more comments, um, do we have a motion? I'll make it. I'll move that the board adopt the attached resolution that readopts the district's discrimination, harassment, and retaliation prevention policy for 2024 and subsequent years. Is there a second? I second that. The motion has been made and seconded. Holly, can you? President Hill? Yes. Direct, um, excuse me, Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to new business. We have discussion and possible action by the board regarding the integrated regional water management agreement. And I believe staff has a presentation on this. Yes. Um, so, um, we're going to have comments from Carly on this one. Carly, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. Um, I'd first like to point out that there's two emotions or two motions accompanying this memo. The first is to execute the memo random of agreement or MOA. And the second is to execute a local project sponsor agreement or LPSA. Um, the Santa Cruz Integrated Regional Water Management, or SCIRWM, manages and coordinates regional water planning in Santa Cruz County. Uh, IRWM was first established as part of a state program that began in 2002. Uh, this is to encourage regional planning and offers funding to participating regions. The district has been participating and signed the first MOA in 2016, and the MOA, MOA is now up for renewal. As well, in 2003, or 2023, sorry, the district submitted a project for funding and received notice it was awarded for $305,000 for fire hardening 13 critical pump house structures. To accept this award, the district will need to execute an LPSA. Both the MOA and LPSA are linked in this memo, and staff is prepared to answer any questions. Mark? Um, this requires a 305000 matching. Do we have that in budget? Yes, that was considered when we applied for the funding. Okay. Okay. That's the only question I have on this, uh, other than the comment of Good job on getting another grant lined up. Thank you. Um, I have a mark. Jamie? No comments. Okay. Did I mark again? Good job. Do we have any comments from the public on this? Thanks. Um, so I had a little bit of trouble understanding the memo. Um, it talks about the $300,000 grant that Director Smalley was just referring to. And then in the last paragraph, it says, with the recent IRWM implementation grant to work 2.5 million, six additional projects. So I guess I got a little confused because it's that's the, the recent. So that's 2023. I mean, the other one's recent. That's 2023. So I guess I... I, I guess maybe I'm not caught up on what the other six projects are. So I had a little trouble understanding the memo. The other thing is, at the very end of the memo, there's five links. Those do not work for me. They don't work on the website. They work and I've seen this before. I've seen this before where there's been a memo in the packet with links. And they don't work for us on the outside. So it may be that you can send emails to each other and the links all work. But these links don't work for for an ordinary member of the public. 
And um, I mean, they look like links to me. They look like they should be links on page 47. I'm just clicking on them. And I'm just so they I'm, work. They work for you. Yeah. They do not work for an ordinary member of the public clicking on the packet. Mm -hmm. And and I guess so I'm aware I'm, I'm making you aware of the issue because you obviously don't understand that you're not making this information available to us. And I don't think that I should have to do a public records request to figure out what those five links are. So unfortunately, this may be extra work for your information technology staff to be able to figure out how to make the links work in the packet. But right now they do. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, and I'm going to refer that one to staff for resolution of the, the link issue on those. And um, I would also ask Carly if you would respond to the question about what the other two and a half million dollar and six projects. Right. So it is a regional grant, so there's multiple agencies participating in IRWN. And that total grant award was for the other projects for other agencies. So a regional Good. grant, and we got three hundred thousand. Exactly. Of the grant. Thank you. Good. Okay. Is there a motion required on this? We have a motion. There's two. Right. Yes. Two. Two motions. Um, Go. I move that the board authorize and direct the interim district manager to execute the 2024 memorandum of agreement with the IRWM on behalf of the district and authorize and direct the interim district manager to execute the local project sponsor agreement to accept the awarded funding with the IRWM on behalf of the district. I'll second that. Any further comments? Call roll. Um, do I do these separately? No. They're tied together. No, it's, a, it's a single motion. Yeah. Yeah, they're tied together. Okay. You, you wouldn't do one without the other. All right. Uh, President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. And Director Smalley? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we are now finished with all the new business on the agenda. We have the consent agenda. Are there any objections to anything on the consent agenda? I have several questions on the uh, district managers, the general manager's report. Uh, is that part that's of the consent? That's, that's not that's the consent agenda. Uh, okay. Never. I'll hold my. Thank you. Okay. So we do need to vote on yeah. the consent. I don't think we have an active objection. No. So I think by default that we now have to vote at where we learned. So go ahead. Okay. okay. President so, Hill. You want to go out to the public? Oh. Oh. Right. That's right. Public. I'm sorry? Public. I couldn't. I'm sorry. You got to go out to the public. Yes, yes. Do we have comments from the public on this item? On the uh, consent agenda. Seeing none. Okay. President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the next item on the agenda is district reports. Does staff wish to present reports? Uh, yes, thank you, President. Um, I did want to make, you know, I guess at the beginning, change the agenda, but I do want to make just one change that I'll speak at the end. Um, and I believe all the other reports are just um, if you have any questions on any of the other reports, the general manager, I'll speak at the end. Any other status reports, department status reports? Yes, I do. Um, um, on the uh, Felton Heights tank, mm -hmm. waiting design, we are, are we close? 
being able to to move forward with we're waiting for uh, geotech to be able to procure an easement so we have an easement to do the survey but um we don't have the geotech done yet that's the next thing is geotech after the survey is done okay and there's no easement at all right now we just have permission permission okay great thank you for that clarification um on the uh fish ladder i was a little confused as to where exactly we are on that um motor control center scheduled for delivery in april but pedestrian bridge scheduled to be open for public after january 19th yeah i'm, I'm like I'm, i don't know what the motor control center is referring to it's the right. SCADA system It'll be delivered and then we'll oh. install it then. That's the last thing that we have to do operationally. Okay. But as Gary put in there, the, the wall bridge is supposed to be open next week, right? Yeah. So they were intending to open it uh, this week, um, but it got delayed. So it'll be open next week. Okay. Well, when I saw motor control, I was like, hmm, are we talking about something across the bridge or something mm -hmm. like that? Oh, it's just telemetry on off control. Yeah, we can, we can use SCADA in parentheses. That, that would have helped. That would help, yes. Um, are we going to have a open house or something out there? Uh, please say yes. I really very much like to do that. After this, I, it's been at least a decade, I believe, that this has been going. This, this would be, yeah, this would be really great to have a celebration out there. Uh, okay, great. And I'm, I mean, I'm really happy to see that there's so many projects that are awaiting final. Yeah, yeah. this is. There's a lot of progress here. This is really, really very, uh, really very good. Pedal to the metal. Um, more, more, more. Okay, great. Thank you. Other comments? I've, I've got a few questions on our, on reports. Yeah, on the general manager's report, um, on page 59, it references the uh, compensation study uh, with uh, consultants been interviewed and selected. Um, who who interviewed, who selected, uh, was that staff? Was that committee also? Um, I can touch on it when I, I am gonna speak on, for the general manager section, I will speak at the end, but I'm happy to answer that one question now. Oh, okay, I didn't ask any general questions. Okay, I didn't understand that part of it. But that's okay, I mean, I can answer it now, so I might as well. Uh, so it was uh, President Hill and uh, Director May. Okay, all right. Well, then I have other questions also. Um, but I'll let you go ahead then with, uh, so am I supposed to ask questions on the department reports now? Sure, any other okay. departments. Okay, all right. Um, the engineering report uh, refers to uh, Brecken Bray Four Springs consolidation, and it mentions phase two plans. Um, uh, how did we get to phase two? Or, or um, in particular, my question is, where's the money coming from on any of the work that we've done so far or that we're doing right now for phase two without any other grant coming into play? And this is on page 63 that it references it. So the phase two plans are right. for the uh, replacement tanks up on Port Springs and the hydro booster system for the houses in the immediate vicinity of the tanks. Right. Okay, and I thought it was the, was it the laterals also that I think I saw? No, it was part of phase one. So the laterals are an issue specifically to Forest Springs, and it's currently not in Sanders' scope. Right. To develop that, they've hired uh, Sherwood engineers. They, they being uh, Forest, Forest Springs. Springs. Okay. Yeah, have hired Sherwood engineers for like a concept. Mm -hmm. set of plans that addresses the laterals. Right. Ultimately, if they are consolidated in the district, that would need to be implemented. Okay. Uh, but they're pursuing that engineering work. The district right now isn't doing that work. Not that the lateral. Sandus is working for the district on the tanks right. and the hydro booster system, which are not included in the right. phase okay. one plans. And that work that Sandus is doing is covered by that DWR grant. Correct. Okay, including those tanks. Okay, all right. Um, on the environmental department report, um, the Lachlan feasibility studies is on page 67. Um, 
we're going back out with the RP. What did we change uh, to, to try to attract somebody? Right. So I think the main somebody. feedback we got from uh, the the firms that we did send out the RP to uh, mentioned that the time frame that we gave, um, or as far as working time frame, was too short. So we did extend that, and we're hoping to get more interest. Okay. So that was the that was the intel that we got right. querying firms. Then. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Um, and on the environmental, uh, is there a mention in the environmental report of the uh, status of the EIR for conjunctive use? I think we've been working so, on that for probably a year right. plus now. Yes. So CBEC, okay. who was working on the, the model for us, uh -huh. has just completed their memo to staff. So we are in the process of reviewing. Um, and then we'll start to move ahead everything else. But it, it, it's kind of a chicken and egg where we'd like to start at least looking into the feasibility of Lock Lomond yeah. prior to really moving ahead with the EIR. But we are getting closer. We've also finalized and worked through an operations plan, mm -hmm. um, which was a piece that was holding up us moving ahead with the project description on the EIR. So. Okay. Uh, okay, question on that. Have we had any conversations with Santa Cruz to get closer to what the cost of raw versus treated water would be relative to a financial analysis on the Lock Lomond feasibility study? Not yet. Um, but Brian has been meeting with the city some some, some not yet. We have a I have a plan to meet with the new director. I'm sorry, could you speak up a little? Sorry, I'm, I have plans to meet with the new director. Uh, yes. uh, has she taken over yet? Uh, no, February, no, no. February. It's, uh, it's, it's yeah. another month or two. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Not yet. Not yet. But okay. soon. Okay. okay. Uh, Jeff, I just yeah. really quick. I, I just want to make a general comment. But, um, I, I found, I, I just want to compliment you all on reformatting these things so it's a little bit easier for me to see what things are at different stages especially in the engineering report you know all the because we have so many different projects and um, I also liked in the general manager's report that that there was a, a look ahead to what might happen next quarter which is mm -hmm. yes. something we haven't had in the past and I think is really important for us to be able to track you know whether we're accomplishing um, our, our goals so um, I, I thank you for implementing that so quickly. Um, I'm taking, you know, over here and everybody accommodating that. So good job. Okay, Brian. Uh, okay, you're on. So, yeah, sorry, that may not have been the most um, convenient format, but um, maybe next time I will just speak at a time. But you could ask all your questions at once. <laughs> So anyway, so current activities, I did take a little bit of liberty. I know it's fourth quarter, but it started November 20th. So it's pretty much what happened maybe up to last week in some cases, but not quite so precise, but I think you get the idea. Um, rate study, I think we know we have, uh, we updated the uh, admin committee earlier in the day today. Um, which was what board direction was that staff would work through the admin committee for the outreach portion. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, once we're done with that, we would report the whole thing back on the 15th of February. Um, and so that event, I know this is looking ahead, but that event is um, Saturday. Staff is definitely well in the throes of gearing up for that. Um, compensation study. Thanks, Mark, for the question. I didn't. Uh, elaborate, but so it was President Hill and Director Mayhood and I that interviewed. Um, we actually reviewed all the consultants' proposals and then we interviewed the top candidate and decided that we were okay with that candidate. Um, and so now it's in the I'm working through the contract with them. Uh, they are owned by a large insurance company, which means they're gonna have comments on our standard agreement. And so there'll be a little bit of back and forth. So I'm, I'm hoping February on that. And I believe we landed on it because you both were on, was it the- um, was it Budget and finance. Budget, budget and finance. And so, I'm not sure about the history of how it landed in that responsibility, but I believe we decided that 
we could go ahead and under that those conflicts. So we did. If, if I could interject, the, the chosen vendor had far and away more experience in doing this than mm -hmm. the other two that we look, were looking at. I'm, I'm so, good. Yeah. I'm good yeah. I don't think yeah. anybody else. I just wanted to know sure. you know, who from our the board yeah. was involved and, in that. And so it was such an obvious choice that we didn't yeah. even think it needed to go back yeah. to budget okay. finance. We're going to bring it directly to to the whole board. Okay. Okay. So also, um, you know, I forgot to mention at the very beginning, you saw all the other department reports. It's kudos to staff here because we're doing a lot. And it's like, I think that's really important that everybody here knows that, that everybody's working pretty hard here. And it's great to be part of an organization and having a staff that's self-motivated and doing all this stuff because it's a lot. Um, so onward, uh, budget review and reconciliation. I've been working with Heather um, and we've been going back and forth on getting a good, I want a good solid handle on not just the capital, projects but what buckets of money we're feeding them from mm -hmm. and that does drive our prioritization of them are they grants are they fema these all have sunsets and timelines that we have to spend the money by so that definitely prioritizes them but not always sometimes it could just be such a headache for op staff that maybe we want to prioritize that for some reason but mm -hmm. anyway it does dovetail into that so that's one thing that i'm up to um Big Basin, we do have the letter that uh, we responded to the customers. I think the big takeaway there is, of course, the board has already spoken on this, that we really can't, it's not, we just are, are unable to do anything more without funding. And so I am, you know, as much as that's true, it's just encouraging those that are asking for consolidation to, to pressure their electeds for funding. Um, Bracken Bray and Forest Springs, I do want to add a little bit to that conversation because we do have a certain amount of money. We have 3.2 million. We spent some of it on design, but the latest is, is that I really ask that we can look at the scope of work that logically connects certain elements of that project and is around that 3.2 million. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes sense to put it together like that and have this definite fix, like this is within grant funds available and that we come up with a functioning, even if it's the truck lines or whatever improvements to our system. And then that also kind of puts us in an awkward position where we can't really enter into a consolidation agreement, but we could at least move one step along from an LOI, a letter of intent, to a pre-consolidation agreement. So each one, and this is with consultation with legal, finance, et cetera, that we've all kind of and some preliminary discussions with the Forest Springs folks. Mm -hmm. So of course, both parties, both mutuals would have to buy into, yes, they accept this is the first step in the scope of work. And that yes, we're going to continue to look for funding, et cetera, et cetera. But that's pretty much in a nutshell what I've got for the mutuals. And also that we're working with Brack and Bray now. We have an estimate and they're um, we're going to work on getting them an emergency inner tie to take them off the receivership. So they're no longer depending on the receivership's cost of water. They can just deal with us. We'll be happy that's with great. that. Yeah. Um, Brian, I have a quick question on that. Alaska, is that? All in the whole game with that too, of the annex and then? Um, I believe, but it's kind of something off in the, on the distance that, you know, it'll, it'll enter into the agreements at some point. So one of, some observations, um, we did have a pretty serious uptick in, in uh, public information requests. We've gone a year with none and Holly has had seven in the last month. Mm -hmm. Um, we are pretty, we're shrewd about making sure that everything checks out with legal. Um, there's information that is readily available. Of course, it's public information. There's information that has certain customer information that we can't divulge, and it's not always intuitive to somebody who's not a legal person. So legal has been very helpful on that. But we have learned a few things along the way, and one of them is just that uh, 
public requests up for information also extended board members, mm -hmm. but not committee members. So anyway, there you have that. Um, so look ahead, the rate study, um, as we know, if we do approve on the 15th, and I say if we do, um, one thing that customer service made me aware of is we are done with our work, but that's when their work starts. It's because they're going to have to retool all the bills. And I'm, certainly there's people that they only look at their bill and they're not, they may not even be watching the whole dialogue about whether there's going to be a rate increase or not, but they're going to get their bill and then they're going to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And so I, looking to how we can support that staff, the three mm -hmm. people that do that. But that an observation on staffing there. Um, Rock and Brand Forest Springs, yes, hopefully that not only that we retool the scope so that we can go to bid for that grant amount, mm -hmm. and that we're looking at ahead for these agreements, the pre-consolidation agreements. Um, and then, but finally we have a line on SRDF funding, state revolving fund. And we have an application and then the other one is just to keep looking for money because we're not done looking. So we have to have a way to find that. So along for that, um, I'll skip the next one. Capital improvement projects, I will be tying all that information that I get with the prioritization this is something that we talked about in the engineering and environmental committee that having a list and sort of prior prioritizing these projects based on funding etc cetera, etc cetera, but having that list and pretty solid in the next few months here having a solid list um, and then also being able to take that and look at staff um, compensation study hopefully in the next month execute the agreement and then I think that we can have it done June, maybe July. I mean, so that we have something. Um, and lastly, tying into that staffing needs is I will look at that compensation study and maybe propose some positions that we don't have or tweaks to the ones we do so that we, at least we have salary information on that. It doesn't say that we're creating or budgeting yet. That would be a formal move by the board, but just to give us options so that we don't have to go turn around and then do a salary study in a position that we are thinking about doing. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. I like this. Yes, that was very, yes, that was yes. Like, <laughs> Yeah, and it gives us the opportunity to then, well, what happened uh, at this point or what are you doing over the next you know, two months on this aspect? Good, good presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, we are now at written communication. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. oh, well, I'm sorry. Do we have an opportunity for questions after public comment? Yes. Or, okay, that's right. Thanks. Go ahead. No, no, no. Bruce is up there right now. Uh, thanks. Uh, the general manager said something about public records requests, and he made some kind of distinction between committee members and board members, and whatever that was, it went over my head. I kind of feel like I'm on equal footing with any committee member or any board member if I want to do a public records request, and we're all the same. So I didn't understand the distinction. Just they don't fall under where we have to give out their information. There's a legal time frame. Okay. For no, I mean, they they're not under it's not that we were asking. It was whether the requests were about us. Yeah, They have to do it for board members, but not for members yeah. of the committees. We can't give out their information. Are there any other questions about the... Uh... Yeah, with respect to the... Um, the rate study and the public outreach efforts, and I sort of broadly define that as educating our community about various aspects of the proposed rate increase. Um, when will we be able to, or is the information about peaking calculations already available for the public and the board uh, to look at? I, I don't recall if we had a anything other than a 
presentation from the Raftelis. Um, and I think it would be great to get that out before February 15th, because it's something I've asked about probably from the beginning of the process when the budget committee came back with, hey, we wanna do tear rates, which in concept I agree with, but there's legal requirements around that. And I wanna make sure as part of diligence that we're meeting those legal requirements. So no need to respond, just I wanna throw that out there as something I think needs to be made public sooner rather than later. Um, I think I heard you say on the prioritization of capital projects that numbers one and one and one would be uh, FEMA and uh, the commitments we made through our um, grants. Is that correct? So uh, those are definitely criteria. Well, I think it'd be worthwhile to know what the criteria might be um, uh, for that. And maybe that's something for the engineering committee to, to look at. The, the reason I'm asking is that a lot of these loans come with certain dates by which you're supposed to do things. Um, and, you know, we can probably, you know, make some, um, the, the lenders, it, in a world where interest rates were low, I don't think the lenders would have necessarily been thinking about making any calls on the loans or anything like that but interest rates aren't where they used to be. And it is now in the interest of lenders to, in fact, replace low interest loans with high interest loans. I do not want the district to get into that kind of a position. So I understand FEMA's got their deadlines and you know the grants have their deadlines, but you know we've got roughly $30 million worth of loans out there that, that do have deadlines. And I know one of them got shifted because of the fire, but I'm not sure about the other one. And I think it's be very worthwhile to engage with council on reviewing those to make sure that we are in good shape because we had to identify projects that they were gonna be applied to. Um, so, well, if I'm yeah. comment, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that the issue of prioritizing these projects is going to depend on a variety of different priorities because there's a matter of deadlines we're dealing with here. We're going to have to sort of take a look at each one and say, you know, which ones fall off the cliff first, which ones are uh, well, I, I, necessary for technical reasons, whatever. But, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. We have to look at the loans. Well, and I think from diligence and oversight and transparency, it's something yes. the board needs visibility into. Um, I, I think I heard this, but I wanted to make sure I'm crystal clear on this. 100% of the work that we're doing on Brack and Bray and Forest Springs is currently covered by the grant. Yes, the inner the inner tie is actually they're paying the cost of the emergency inner tie. Well, I should say grant or Brack and Bray or FEMA or, or FEMA. Yes, thank yes. you. FEMA's in there too. Okay. We're not pulling money out of our capital budgets to cover any of this. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I mean, I, I you may have answered it, but I want to make sure it's crystal clear. I want to make sure FEMA was part of that, not just. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's good, James. That, that's great to put in there because it really is, we're not, we, that is, our ratepayers aren't paying for it, right? Because that was a commitment we made to our community uh, when we did that. Um, and on the big basin, oh, on the big basin water uh, company situation, we still have the filling station up. No, is there any demand for it? No, their boil water notice is off, lifted. Okay. So no more filling station, and we are supplying them through bulk water intertie. Okay. If they did get into a situation, put it back up. Put it back up. Okay, I want to make sure that that at least from my perspective, we need to do everything that we've yeah. been doing to support them. If they don't have portable water, we will be sure that the filling station goes back up. And Jonathan from the state contacts us and Don't lets us know what's going on. And I think we'd already improved that going entering into an an intertie agreement is, or did we not approve that? I think Certainly we discussed who. With Big Basin, sorry, the topic. We are, Basin. that's already been all done, it's in. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah we're, okay. we're pumping water to them constantly right now. Okay, good. Okay, There's so, no I mean, that is that is really a big deal. Yeah. As long as they keep their, as long as they keep their system clean, mm -hmm. uh, they, they've got 
reliable water at this point, and we're getting paid for it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I'll echo comments, Brian. I, it's it, this is a dramatic improvement in um, the method of communication with the board. Thank you for doing that. Okay, moving on. Written communications. We had a letter to the board from Deborah Lowen. Is there any need to read that at this meeting? Or I don't think so. Um, and we just, just just discussed the letter to Big Basic Water Company. Um, unless there's any objection, I think we're we're finished for the day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good evening.